Okay, welcome to class five of the free BJCP prep course. Today we are going to be covering the basics of water. I will mention that this course is not officially sanctioned by the BJCP. This is something that I am putting out there on my own to help anybody who is doing some self-study. Maybe they don't have access to a BJCP prep course and they are just reading the study guide and they just want a little, a little something extra to help them out. That is what I'm attempting to provide here. Um, this whole course is brought to you by barleypotmaker.info, which is my website. Um, my name is Jason Johnson, and I am a national judge with the BJCP and an exam grader. So with this out of the way, let's get started talking about water. So how is water and the BJCP exam, what is their relationship? Well, the BJCP... Um, does not go into a lot of depth on water. It's not meant, uh, what they do provide is not meant to be like a master's course in water chemistry um, in relation to brewing, but um, what is there is important to know for the entrance exam. There's only three pages total in the study guide that you're going to find um, in the BJCP, but it's going to cover some of the things that you are going to need to know um, in order to understand how to adjust your mash pH. Maybe not so much the the fine details and the hows and whys, but it's going to tell you um, a little bit so you have an understanding of what you need to do and why you need to acidify your mash. It may not go into a lot of depth about the, um, the minerals that you need in order to do um, these adjustments and, and how big of an impact they'll have. That kind of stuff you're going to have to learn on your own through experimentation, doing um, maybe reading the uh, water book by John Palmer and Colin Kaminsky, or listening to some water podcasts um, in brewing. Some um, I know the Brew Strong has a nice four-part series on it. Or uh, just get some of the free water spreadsheets and start messing around with your water profile and some put in some... Uh, grain bills you have for your beers and see how they come out as far as pH. Uh, 85 to 90 percent of your beer is water. So I always find it kind of funny that a lot of people say that, you know, water isn't really that important to to understand in, in your brewing process. And granted, it should be one of the last things that you work on because it is, it can be pretty complicated and you can really mess up your beer uh, pretty easily. Uh, by um, adding too many minerals to it, but um, to just discard water completely as being something that you don't even really have to worry about, um, to me is a little bit ridiculous. Only 10 to 15 percent of your beer is uh, compounds derived from malt, hops, yeast, and other you know byproducts from fermentation and and you know maybe some additives you may have added in. So you know up to 90 percent of your beer is water. So if your water doesn't taste good, your water, your beer isn't going to taste good. Uh, and that's the stance that the BJCP takes for the most part in regards to water. And they say that if it's a, if uh, your water is drinkable, it's appropriate for brewing. And that's true to a point. You know, you're going to be able to make a decent beer with just about any water that you have for in any style you want to create. But if you really want to tweak your beer and you really want to be on point with your various styles, you need to understand how these minerals affect your beer and how they affect your grain bills. Uh, it does acknowledge that you know some adjustments of water may be needed in order to mimic water used in historical styles, such as maybe Pilsen, Burton-on-Trent, um, Dublin, places like that. Um, you're, you're always going to have to know what your local water source is, and you can get that information either from contacting your um, your water treatment plant, you know, your local municipal facility, or you take a water sample and send it into some place like Ward Labs, and they'll give you a report back on what your water profile looks like. Um, the BJCP also does acknowledge that, you know, some adjustments uh, may be needed based on your water, your local water profile, in order to um, hit the proper pH levels. It also talks a little bit about chlorine and chloramines. Chlorine and chloramines are used by your uh, municipal water company in order to treat your water as it makes its way to your home so that that 
that water for the most part is safe to drink. It's not it's not going to contain any pathogens. Um, chlorine is very easy to remove. It can be removed either by boiling or by simply off-gassing. And in order to off-gas, you just take all of the water that you're going to use for brewing that day, and you put it in some buckets and you let it sit overnight. All that chlorine will dissipate naturally on its own. Chloramine is a little bit more stable, and it's a little bit more difficult to remove. Um, chlorine can be removed by either active charcoal filtration or Camden tablets. I do both, just to be on the safe side. I filter and then I treat my water with Camden tablets. And one Camden tablet will treat 20 gallons of water. Um, when that Camden um, dissolves in your water, it instantly breaks apart chloramines into its various components, and those components um, are free to leave your beer fairly, or free to leave your water fairly easily. As when it is chloramine, it's very stable and it is stuck in your water till you break it down and remove it. If you're thinking about using reverse osmosis water or distilled water, I'll put those into the same grouping. Um, you should be aware that that uh, those have all minerals stripped out of them. Um, and a lot of those minerals, like iron, manganese, copper, zinc, calcium, sodium, all of those are very important for um, both mash and for a healthy fermentation. So you'll have to add those back in um, if you are using RO water um, in order to have you know a beer that that tastes the way it should, that your pH is where it needs to be. And uh, you can add in brewing salts and nutrients, you know, in order to accomplish that. Um, if you're an extract brewer, you can use RO water or distilled water uh, without any issue because the maltster that made your malt extract had to use, you know, their local water source in order to get that mash where it needed to be. Now, when they evaporate all of that water out, either either the dry malt extract or the liquid malt extract will still contain those minerals. So I usually suggest, like whenever I do an extract beer, I use distilled water because I don't want those minerals in my beer because there's already minerals in the extract. So when you're adding it to like your your local water supply, let's say you have some hard water that has a lot of dissolved solids in it, you're adding even more solids to it. So you could end up with some issues. That's something to think about if you're an extract brewer and you have some flavors that you just can't quite seem to get rid of. It, it could be the water. So look into if you're using um, like a hard water in addition to this extract. Um, but the BJCP does state that mineral water or spring water is a better choice than RO or deionized water. And what they're talking about with that is they're talking about all grain beers. They're not talking about extract. Um, a lot of the instruction in the study guide is geared towards all grain brewing. It's not really geared so much towards extract brewing. So what I suggest is if you're an extract brewer, go with distilled water and utilize the minerals that are in the extract instead of adding more an unknown amount of minerals to your existing water profile. But I digress. So let's... Uh, get back into the swing of things here. Um, most water does contain low concentrations of bacteria. Boiling is required at some point prior to fermentation. Now your beer is going to have um, a certain level, you know, a certain pH level to it that's going to offer some protection. You're going to have some hops and as fermentation starts you're going to have some alcohol. That is going to offer your, your beer some protection. So nine times out of ten you're probably going to be fine if you have to add um, top up water to your beer and you don't have an opportunity to boil it. However, you're kind of playing with fire because nine times out of ten means that one time out of ten you could potentially end up with um, some sort of uh, contamination. So let's get into the part that can really throw some people for a loop. Um, it's not as quite as difficult as it may sound. We're going to talk about alkalinity, pH, and hardness real quick. We're just going to kind of breeze over this and give you uh, just the down and dirty that you need to know. So water is a, it's a, it's a solution of ions with negative anions and positive cation charges. These are um, water is disassociated into basically two parts. 
hydroxide and hydrogen. And hydrogen, if you look at here, the hydrogen and the hydroxide, you have one O molecule, which is your oxygen, and one hydrogen. And over here, you have one hydrogen. So what is water? Water is H2O. It's one oxygen and two hydrogen. So what we have is we have our one oxygen and we have our two hydrogen. That's water. H2O. Two hydrogen, one oxygen. pH is shorthand, which is referring to the concentration of hydrogen ions. For example, uh, 7 pH water is e it ha as equal hydroxide and hydrogen concentrations, corresponding to a pH of exactly 7. So your H2O is essentially perfect. You have equal parts hydroxide, hydrogen from the hydroxide, and hydrogen here. As you can see, you have your positives and negatives. So you're coming up exactly even on the pH scale. A lower pH, or something that's a little bit more acidic, indicates a higher hydrogen concentration. Um, higher pH, such as you start getting a, above 7. That's the funny thing about pH, is it's, it's always kind of weird to think, you know, your lower pH is acidic and your higher pH as being alkaline or basic. Um, I don't know about you, but I always have a hard time thinking 7 and above as being basic because I would think, you know, as a pH gets higher, my, my brain always wants to think that it should be more acidic. And as it gets lower in pH, that it should be basic and not as acidic. But it's the opposite. Um, higher pH or alkaline or basic um, water has a higher concentration of hydroxide than hydrogen. pH is determined by the hardness, alkalinity, and buffering salts. Um, alkalinity is a measure of the capacity of the dissolved anions, or, you know, your hydroxide and whatever other anions are in there, you know, the, your negatives. Uh, alkalinity is a measure of the capacity of the dissolved anions to neutralize reductions in the pH value of the solution. Now this is most the most important anion at the pH of brewing water and wort is bicarbonate. That is, um, how can I explain that? That's basically your your hardness. Your bicarbonate is listed on a water report as HCO3 negative. Bicarbonate reacts with calcium ions when boiled to form a calcium carbonate precipitate and also water. Um, so basically what this means is that by boiling your water you're going to drive off CO2 which forces calcium and bicarbonate ions out of solution. You'll actually see little white flakes in your beer or in your water as you boil it if you have if you have high water with a with a high bicarbonate level um, this what this will do is as this precipitate comes out it reduces the alkalinity of your beer or it it reduces um, basically the ability of your water to buffer you know, your grain. So you're going to be able to adjust your pH. You're going to be able to get that acidity down a little bit easier if you pre-boil your beer and you get some of this precipitate. Um, the equation used to figure this out, it's a little complicated to talk about, but basically you have calcium plus 2 bicarbonate equals calcium carbonate, which is the precipitate, plus water plus carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, as we know, it is an acid. Um, so any CO2 that is dissolved in your beer is, or in your water is going to help to lower the, the um, pH of the water as a whole. The calcium carbonate, as that drops out, that leaves. So that helps reduce the buffering capacity of the water. Permanent hardness is the cations remaining after racking off the precipitate. Permanent hardness is primarily due to calcium and magnesium ions, and these cations are permanent if they are derived from sulfate or chloride salts 
and they're temporary if they originate in carbonate or bicarbonate salts. I know it can be very difficult to understand, but that is what you need to know. I mean, if you can just memorize that, you should be okay. So why, why is this important to know? Now I'm just going to give you a statement on why the previous slide is important to know. An important process in brewing that helps you adjust the pH of the mash is the enzymatic degradation of phytin in the malt to form phytic acid and calcium or magnesium phosphates, which will precipitate in your mash. Most of the phytic acid comes from, from free calcium to form more calcium phosphate, releasing hydrogen ions in the process. This reaction generally takes place during the acid rest, or if you're not doing an acid rest, it will also take place somewhat in your mash, and it helps regulate the mash pH to the 5.2 and 5.7 range, which is appropriate for the breaking down of starches and proteins. That's why you want your mash to be in the 5.2 to 5.7 range. Ideally, you're looking at 5.3 to 5.4 as the sweet spot. Um, most water supplies have too much alkalinity for this process to be effective. So in most cases, you want to add a little bit of acid to your mash, which would be like a little bit of phosphoric acid or lactic acid uh, to the brewing liquor, unless you are able to use other salts. You know, they, they don't discuss a whole lot in the um, study guide about the use of like uh, gypsum or, or um, you know, the other brewing salts that you might want to use to adjust your pH. They're just talking about taking the shortcut of adding some lactic or phosphoric acid. Ideally, everything we talked about in the last slide is meaningless to brewing except for one thing. The one thing we're looking at is we're looking at bringing our pH to 5.2 to 5.7. So understanding alkalinity and hardness and how to reduce that hardness by through boiling and getting that calcium to participate out into into those little white flecks and to, and to release some of that, that uh, carbon dioxide to bring the natural pH of the water down. Say your, say your pH of your water, of your local supply, is at 8. And you want to try to get it down into that 7 range so that when you start adding grains, you get to 5, 2, to 5, 7 into that range. You start hitting this spot in your mash, you're going to have excellent efficiency. Your finished pH of your beer is going to be at the desirable range somewhere in the 4 to 5 pH range of the finished beer. It's going to taste a lot more um, full. It's going to have some right, nice vibrant flavor to it. Everything in the end boils down to getting your beer into this range for the mash. As I talked about before, pre-boiling the water will help effectively reduce the alkalinity of the water, reducing this, the need to add this lactic acid or this phosphoric acid. However, if you do decide to pre-boil, that's a much longer process in your brew day. Personally, I add a little bit of acid to my mash, and I also do wa uh, adjustments with um, either gypsum or lime, and depending on what um, beer style that I'm making. So I, I use uh, some of the beer spreadsheets to, or the pH water spreadsheets to help me adjust my water to where it needs to be based on my local water supply, which I've, I've sent off to Ward Lab, so I have a report. And then I'll put in my grain bill and I'll see where my estimated pH is going to be and I adjust with salts as needed. So there are some important ions in brewing water. We just went through a whole bunch of stuff that it's really confusing for me to talk about because I'm not an expert at it. I understand it, but it's very difficult for me to teach it because while I understand it in my brain, it's hard to make a connection in my brain to come out of my mouth into a way that I feel that somebody could understand. But these ions that we're going to talk about are the most important ones that you can deal with in your, in your brewing water. And I'm going to tell you what, what they do. So calcium is the most important cation in brewing. Calcium is essential for the reduction of mash pH. Um, 
It helps keep, keep oxalate salts in solution, which helps with clarity and helps prevent gushing. Calcium helps reduce tannin extraction, and calcium also aids in the protein coagulation, such as our hot and cold break. Magnesium has the same reactions as calcium above, but it's not nearly as effective. Uh, magnesium is required by your yeast in the 10 to 20 parts per million range uh, for fermentation. You just need to be careful because high amounts of magnesium uh, can give you a harsh mineral type taste. Sodium, sodium helps accentuate sweetness. Um, all of your water will contain some level of sodium, but in high amounts it will come across being salty, which totally makes sense. Anions Bicarbonate is probably one of the most talked about anions that you're going to find in your water. And bicarbonate determines the alkalinity of your brewing water. Um, bicarbonate neutralizes acids from dark roasted malts. So you're going to, you know, if you have a high bi bicarbonate level, you basically have um, a high buffering tolerance of your beer. Um, bicarbonates also react with calcium to reduce hardness, and it promotes the... Ex it promotes the extraction of tannins and coloring compounds. So if you have um, very hard water and you're, you're you know, having some issues with um, uh, astringency, it could be your bicarbonate levels are pretty high and they're helping to extract tannins. Um, sulfate and chloride. They're, neither one is significant in the act of brewing itself, but they are important in the finished flavor of the beer. Um, sulfite, so you can have either calcium sulfite or calcium chloride. Um, those are common additions to your um, to your beer. Um, this is, would be your gypsum. Your sulfite would be your gypsum. And it accentuates bitterness. Um, Sulfates also accentuate dryness, and a notable um, historical water source, Burton-on-Trent, has high concentrations of sulfate, which is why it's uh, very popular in your uh, pale ale and IPA uh, beers. A lot of people try to emulate the Burton-on-Trent because it accentuates bitterness. Chloride, you can get uh, you know calcium chloride as well. And that is not significant in brewing either. However, it enhances sweetness at low levels. So you're going to get a lot, a little bit more of a um, malty, full malt feel in a beer that has uh, higher calcium chloride levels. Or if you add calcium chloride additions, it will help enhance sweetness and maltiness at low levels. What you want to avoid is adding too much, because if you add too much, it can hamper flocculation of your yeast. Um, it will, you know, come out a little bit more cloudy, and you, you'll have more yeast in suspension. You could add a, end up with some more yeasty flavors. As far as making comments about water on a score sheet when you're judging, it's important to be sure that you only offer advice on, on water adjustments if you're fairly confident in the process yourself. Um, I tend to not make a whole lot of water comments unless it's it's pretty obvious that a brewer added, you know, a whole big tub of gypsum into their beer. And, um, you know, it comes across extremely harshly bitter. And uh, I, I just generally don't, because I don't consider myself an expert in water, uh, enough to tell somebody else what they are going to be um, dealing with in, with their water. But just like other components, it's generally good, good practice not to assume a brewer used an ingredient. You know, for for example, in your comments, don't say use gypsum in your next batch because you never know. That brewer may have used gypsum in this batch. Um, however, the opposite can be true because you can say adding gypsum may help enhance bitterness in a beer where, where some more bitterness would be desired because even if that brewer did use some gypsum, you may be asking them, you, you know, 
maybe if you don't want to increase your hops, which generally that's the direction I'm going to go, is I'm going to tell them to add more bittering addition of hops. But if you want to go the gypsum route, you could tell them to um, maybe add a little bit more gypsum to help bring out that, that bitterness. Um, one assumes a brewer used an ingredient when he very well may not have. That's generally a bad practice um, in my eyes because that turns people off. If you tell somebody, you know, you need to use, um, you know, do some dry hopping in your, in this IPA, that person may have dry hopped the beer and you don't know it. They just maybe didn't dry hop it long enough or they didn't add enough. But if you tell them to dry hop and they did it, they're going to be a little, a little discouraged and you may lose a little bit of, of credibility in your, in your ability to judge the beer. So, just make sure that you don't make assumptions and in ingredients or processes that a brewer has used. You know, you can say, if you dry hopped, you may want to, you know, use more hops in that dry hop. Or if you dry hopped, you may want to dry hop for a longer period of time. The other can hold true even if the brewer did use gypsum. That assumption can be made. Uh, that's just what I just talked about just before, so we won't cover that again. Uh, comments about water could be appropriate for the following faults. Um, there are um, some faults that are pretty uh, distinguishable as far as, you know, that they came from the water, such as sulfur. Um, you may want to ask the, the brewer to check their iron content if they were not brewing a lager. Lagers can tend to be, you know, lager yeast can tend to be a little high in sulfur, but if you get an ale and it's kind of sulfury, you may, you know, tell them, you know, check your fermentation process a little bit or check your water and make sure that you don't have a high iron content. Um, if a beer is highly metallic, again, that could be an issue with, with a high iron content. You'll come across that sometimes when people use well water to brew. You may end up with a lot of sulfur or a lot of uh, a highly metallic flavor and aroma. A beer that's exceedingly harshly bitter uh, could possibly be sulfate levels. They may have overdone the gypsum, or their water may naturally contain a high level of um, of sulfates. If it's overly malty, they can check the chloride content of the water, you know, the opposite of sulfate. Um, if you do get a little bit of a salt, a salty flavor, a little sodium, uh, the sodium content of the water can come uh, come about. Uh, somebody's adding too many water salts. Um, you can buy a water salt um, brewing, you know, like Burton on Trent water salt packets and things like that. And some people tend to go a little bit overboard on those packages, and they can actually come across tasting salty. And other water comments you know, you can make as you become more comfortable and more experienced with water if you feel you want to go that route. I I generally find that there's other comments you can make that will help them adjust their beer that doesn't always get into water chemistry. And maybe it's just because I'm not, you know, a, a water chemistry expert. You know, I've, I've read the water book. I do my own adjustments. I just don't feel comfortable enough telling others, um, about what water adjustments that they should be making. I think uh, with a few more years, maybe maybe I'll be comfortable enough with that personally. But Some famous brewing waters. This is just a table. As you can see, Pilsen generally has a uh, very soft water profile. Very low in bicarbonate, low in chlorides, low in sulfates. Calcium is a little bit lower than what you would generally want. Magnesium, sodium, also very low. Compare that to your very high Burton on Trent. Very high in calcium, very high in bicarbonate. Sulfate levels are through the roof, um, especially when you compare it to your chloride. Um, a little bit more balanced would be maybe your, your London, London Ale. Um, it's not exactly balanced, but it's a little bit more in balance than some of the other ones between your sulfates and your chlorides. Um, Dortmund's not too bad. You know, a lot of these that have, if you look at the sulfates, anyone that has a higher sulfate level than chloride level is going to accentuate bitterness a little bit more than it's going to accentuate the multi aspect of the beer. So, 
I'll give you just a minute to look these over just for your own interest. These these charts can easily be found online just about anywhere. The mo main thing I wanted to point out was the comparison between very soft water of Pilsen to the very hard water of Burton. Uh, we come to the end of this class. I already talked about some other excellent water sources. Water, a Comprehensive Guide for Brewers by John Palmer and Colin Kaminsky. I didn't, I didn't add his name in there, but it's a great book. You can read up to Chapter 7. As a home brewer, you don't need to read Chapters 8, 9, and 10 because they deal a lot more with like wastewater and um, professional brewing, uh, treating your water as it leaves a facility. But Chapters 1 through 7 cover alkalinity, pH, hardness, water adjustments. It's an excellent book if you are looking at making your own adjustments in your own brewing process. And then um, if you like, rather listen to podcasts, The Water Show on uh, the Brewing Network, on the their Brew Strong segment, they have four of them. Water Show 1, 2, 3, and 4, all of them very excellent sources of getting some water information. The next class, we're going to be covering malts and malting, and we'll get out of this water chemistry, and we'll get into some some of the more comfortable territory for us brewers. That's malt and malting. We'll be covering hops a little bit later, yeast, fermentation, now that we've got this water out of the way. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Uh, but like I've been stating throughout this whole thing, I'm by far no water guru. Um, I know enough to help my own beers, and that's about the extent of my my comfort zone in water with brewing. 